<laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so this actually, this presentation, if I'd given it, if I'd picked, been picked for a Friday sli uh, time slot, I would have done very differently. But uh, there was great, you know, there was the keynote talking about uh, the new UI and uh, responsiveness. Uh, there was a great session yesterday by Seth. Uh, there was another one just before this one by, by Paolo. So I think that uh, I, I didn't want to rehash uh, uh, a lot of the things that uh, were said in these great presentations. And I wanted to approach it more from basically an actual use case. So, uh, and basically taking my site as a use case of you know, why I chose to do this. And then talk also about things beyond responsiveness, but basically to uh, for e-commerce site to be able to get more customers, uh, uh, you know, have people go in the pipeline. And, um, and so first I want to just so, uh, want to find out from, from the audience, uh, from you guys, uh, how many people were in the uh, responsiveness uh, session yesterday uh, by Seth? Okay. <laughs> uh, how many were in the Paolo session earlier? Okay, so actually there's not, okay, all right, so there's not, not, not many people. So. Um, Quick intro about, about me, uh, I'm actually uh, my own worst customer because uh, unlike many of you, uh, I run a business that does not target the Joomla community. It uses Joomla as its, uh, uh, you know, as its engine and, and I, I rely on Joomla to, to run my business, but it actually is uh, um, it's a French learning uh, business that I run with my wife. Uh, and so by day, you know, I have, a regular business uh, owner's kind of uh, uh, worries and, and, uh, and I look at you know, things beyond Joomla. Uh, but by night, and you know, probably 30% of my time, I also do Joomla consulting and, and, and freelancing and all this. So you know, I'll actually have, when I have a problem that I need to solve using Joomla, I usually uh, uh, you know, have both my business point, uh, uh, my business side saying, okay, I need to get these goals you know, for my business and then find a technology that matches it versus just looking at kind of delivering a site to a customer where you kind of maybe more worry about you know, your deliverables and how the user's gonna use it. Uh, I'm actually kind of uh, uh, using, you know, really looking at both sides uh, when, when making decisions in Joomla. So quickly, uh, about French Today, so it's frenchtoday.com. Uh, it's been around for four years, and we basically have about 110 plus hours of uh, audiobooks and audio recordings. Uh, my wife is mostly the content creator, I also do some of it, which are broken down in about 17 downloadable products. Uh, and also there's you know, about an hour and a half free for, for access, so there's, there's a store, there's a registered area where you get additional content once you create a profile. We also have a very extensive blog. Uh, it's, it's been out, uh, around for two years only and we have more than 260 blog posts that are you know, very comprehensive uh, uh, that we don't usually kind of feature product but just kind of more conceptual about learning French and, and uh, French culture. And the key thing again to, to, to think about is that uh, you know, this site targets non-technical users. Uh, we are used, you know, we, we know a lot about technology and, and, and uh, uh, we're used to, to very much dealing with people that know a lot about technology. Uh, uh, you know, the level of my users to explain it is, is, you know, I get basically support calls saying, uh, what's the difference between a PDF and an MP3? Right, so that's the, <laughs> that's the level of, uh, of, uh, uh, of users that I have to deal. So when I make a decision on, on building the site, you know, the usability and all this, I have to keep that in mind. About the store part, so uh, uh, frenchtoday.com uh, has really been uh, since uh, about four years as a full, uh, uh, full business. Started as uh, Joomla just for the presentation side with a kind of a rough uh, uh, integration with Zencart, which is an op another open source uh, uh, cart. Quickly moved to uh, uh, virtual uh, you know, VM. Um, but actually using a K2 Mart, so I don't know if, you, if anybody's familiar with K2 Mart, it's basically a way to use the K2 uh, uh, content as the presentation layer and use, uh, uh, use uh, the VM uh, uh, shopping cart as more of a kind of just purely transactional. 
Uh, and when I decided to move to uh, Joomla 2.5 uh, back in February, actually I was also kind of, you know, again, looking at different technologies to try to find the one that fit my, my needs best, and I settled on RedShop. And what's different about this, uh, the, the site also a little bit is that, you know, there's a lot, there are a lot of store, um, you know, sites where there's a store button, so you have your regular site, then you hit store, and you're almost kind of in a different experience. It might look the same, might be skinned a little bit the same, but it's, you kind of almost feel like there's a technology or there's, there's something, you know, there's, there's either you're doing the site part or you're doing the store part. And, and the goal with FrenchToday.com was trying to have the most seamless integration between the presentation, because we do have quite a lot of content. You know, we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe 10 hours of free content, 260 blog posts, so, and also the store, because I wanted users to kind of feel as they had one coherent experience and not feel like they were jumping back and forth between different, you know, between a store and an actual site. So, the question is, you know, why make your store responsive? And if you've been to the other sessions, uh, and you know, responsive seems to be probably the buzzword of, uh, of uh, Jab 12, and everyone will say, well, because that's where you know, the future is going, that's where uh, um, you know, we, in the future, you know, those devices, all these things. But if you look at it from a business point of view, to answer this question, it's simple. Look at your audience. Right? We all have stats. We all have uh, uh, Google Analytics running on our site, I hope. Uh, we all have uh, commerce tracking, so you can basically get stats on who comes to your site. And so, you know, the first thing you should do is not think in abstract, oh, should my site be responsive because that's the new thing? But it should be, you know, does it serve my customers? And, you know, what, 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 what's happening today on my site? And so I went to Google Analytics, and I looked at basically very basic. It took me, you know, five minutes. Uh, I looked at my mobile visits, you know, uh, uh, over the last 12 months. Now, without even seeing the numbers, you see that in just 12 months, that's quite an increase. So, and, and also, it's just my target audience, non-technical users. So, we all have, you know, most of us have iPads and devices and all this, but non-technical non users might not have access to all these devices. Yet, my, if I compare April of last year, where my mobile traffic was about 4.9%, so about 5%, and I compared it to last month, that's 9.3. That's in just 12 months, that's a huge jump. So it's something that I need to think about. And if you look at the stats, it's not just the visits that increased, it's also my mobile users have about the same pages per visit than my desktop users have almost the same visit duration itself by about 10, 15 seconds. They have the same bounce rate, so either I'm doing something right or doing something totally wrong, so that's another question. Uh, and actually, the key thing as a business owner that last month, mobile users were responsible for 10% of my revenue. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy to think that, oh, well, you know, and Seth covered it really well in his session, you know, we try to think that, oh, well, mobile browser, you know, users do things differently. And, you know, that's maybe something we think of, but as a business user, what you do is you turn to numbers, you turn to hard facts, not feelings, and you look at your numbers, and again, that's is my case, your site might be different. Your users might actually be 20%, or they might be 1%, but whatever, you do is this is going to change, this is going to evolve, so you better get ready. To put this in another perspective, mobile traffic today is more users than IE9. Now, you wouldn't think about releasing a site for a client or for yourself that basically did not target IE9. That, that's just unconceivable, right? Yet, for me, I have as many mobile users as I have IE9 users. So to say that, oh well, you know, I, I, I don't have you know, the budget to make a separate site, I don't want to worry about it, you know, we'll, we'll get to it later, that's not a good business decision. So forget about the theory, these are facts, as a business user, 
10% of revenue, I cannot afford to not take care of these guys. So now that you've decided to go responsive, which framework do you want to use? So you can do, if you're a you know, hardcore CSS guru, like my friend Seth there, you could you know, roll up your sleeves and build your own you know, template and your own framework and, and your own classes and all this. You know, I'm not an expert like he is, and also I don't have the time to do this because I'm also running my business. So I'm going to look at best practices. I'm going to look at things that people have done already that I can leverage. And today, it's, you know, Twitter bootstrap. We've, I hope by now you've heard about it. Again, you know, no, you know word number two, buzzword number two of the show. Uh, and then another one also, a very uh, a popular one, uh, you know, definitely in terms of scale, you know, tw Twitter bootstrap is way above anybody else, but uh, is one uh, from Zurb Foundation. And actually, one of the founders of that framework went to work at Twitter to create Bootstrap. So that they have kind of a, 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 you know, a common base. And you know, Zurb Foundation has kind of almost, it's, it looks very similar to Bootstrap, has kind of the same concepts. Uh, the design's a little bit different. And there are a lot of other you know, frameworks or, or, th or, or things that have, people have already built to help you go responsive. You know, 320 and up is another one. I would strongly recommend you look at uh, OneWeb, which is also uh, really cool. Congrats, Seth. Um, for my case, for Frenchly.com, we went to uh, Zurb Foundation uh, instead of Bootstrap. Uh, why, why is that? So one is because it had clean baseline styles, so uh, uh, not only does it help you in making your site responsive, it also provides you, you know, a collection of styles, you know, your headers, uh, uh, you know, buttons, tables, and things that kind of look already kind of integrated and, and work well together. The fonts are proportional, your titles are proportional, and that's, you know, that's already a good, you know, that, that takes you a step forward to, to making a site, you know, responsive without having to reinvent the wheel. Uh, it's super quick for prototyping. You can, you know, the best thing is, is uh, I, I, you know, I used to, when I created a site, I used to fire up fireworks, you know, kind of start, you know, moving elements around. Then my, uh, my boss, who's my wife, uh, we, you know, would sit down, I would show her the, uh, the site and go, yeah, that's awesome. And she's like, oh yeah, okay, can you make this red? Can you do this? And I'm like, uh, yes, okay, go make a sandwich for 10 minutes, you know, have yourself a sandwich, then come back and, and maybe I'll be able to, 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 to change all these things. Ch you know, building prototypes with actual live HTML pages, and you can just do purely HTML, you don't need to be in Joomla, and just is very quick, because then and only do you build your prototypes, but then you can actually interact with your prototypes and resize the windows and see how the, 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 the mobile views and, and the different views kind of reframe. So you can show that to your client and uh, uh, be able to really quickly prototype it. Now, you can do that also with Bootstrap. So it's not just unique to, to, to Zurb, but it's, it's also a new way to think about prototyping and creating uh, 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 things that you can actually test before you actually implement. Uh, one of the things that uh, Zurb Foundation offers that Bootstrap doesn't is, uh, is source ordering. So, there's some controversy about source ordering. Uh, you know, some people think that you know semantic markup absolutely has to uh, uh, to, to to follow the uh, the layout. So if if you don't know, source ordering is basically a way to uh, display, let's say, you know, some content on the left, and then uh, you know, like a navigation on your left, content on your right. It's not going to flipped around. Sorry. Uh, and then be able to, when you squeeze everything to one column, or if you look at the HTML code, to have the thing that visually appears first, the code actually be at the end. So that's a way to source order. So, so your, your, the code or the HTML markup does not necessarily reflect the actual, the way the page is laid out. So uh, this is good for, uh, uh, for a lot of things. It's good for uh, uh, when you, again, when you go, we'll see later, when you go to a mobile view and you have to reshuffle everything into you know, a single column, it's also good for SEO. Uh, so there's a lot of advantages, and that's something that Zurb Foundation offers. Some other do, frameworks do too. That's something that Bootstrap does not. And actually, they've publicly said that they don't want to do this. So, um, so that's uh, one thing to consider. But th there's been a lot of people asking in the community about it. Uh, but really, honestly, bottom line, 
is that I chose Zurb Foundation four weeks before Bootstrap 2.0 came out, and Bootstrap was a great framework in version one, but it was not responsive. Uh, and then the 2.0 is really what added the, the, the whole responsive and the, the resizing, uh, and that basically got released you know, uh, uh, four weeks after I made the decision to start working. So. Uh, that's basically you know one of the reasons. So in your case, you know what sh what framework should I ch you know should you choose? Um, you know again, you know Bootstrap uh, has been uh, you know everyone is in the Joomla community is is moving towards boot Bootstrap. So you know I would choose Bootstrap unless you have a very specific reason otherwise. So bottom line, you know uh, 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 this would have you know this slide would have been very different if. The PLT had not made that decision a couple of weeks ago to basically move, you know, Joomla there. So because there's going to be a lot of support, uh, uh, both on the front end and the back end for Bootstrap. So unless you have a specific reason to, I would suggest you go to Bootstrap. Uh, not only that, but also uh, uh, you know a lot of other extension providers have said that they're moving to Bootstrap too. So it'll, it'll be a lot easier for you to uh, uh, to basically, you know rapidly develop your site versus having to reinvent the wheel. So what does responsive web design affect? Uh, it's not just about reshuffling the layout. So you know, that's definitely the, mean, the, the main uh, uh, reason is to be able to have a, a layout that is compatible in all the different devices that you're using. But there's also a lot of things that you think about. So let's you know, first look at the layout. So this is a screenshot of one of the pages on our site. Uh, you'll see that it's a very standard, you know, very standard layout. Uh, you've got your, you know, logo and, and, and navigation bar at the top. You have your search box and some, and some of your uh, social icons on top right hand. Kind of an inverted L, you know, a very classic design with, you know, some of the uh, uh, kind of call to actions or additional content on the sidebar. And then your main content area. And actually this is, the, even though it looks like a three column layout, this is actually uh, uh, you know left column and then a content, and the content itself inside the content is actually split into two columns. And if you scroll down, you're gonna see that again modules, you know, pretty standard, some audio players, some tabs, you know, basically everything is aligned. Now let's take a look at this layout and how it looks in uh, an iPad on a horizontal uh, in a portrait uh, landscape mode. Uh, there ver there's, there's practically no changes. You know, uh, uh, one of the things, you know, I wanted the experience to be kind of the same between uh, uh, an iPad and, uh, and a desktop, and, and, and you know, that layout actually worked pretty well. I mean, there's, there's definitely fonts and text that rewrap, maybe not ideally, and it's true that I could spend another, you know, several hours going in and kind of tweaking so that things wrap better. But again, you know, 80-20 rule, you know, my goal was really to have an experience that is, that is good enough, and as time goes, I can actually increase, you know, and make it even slicker. So here, what happens, pretty much nothing. We, you know, we have an extensive menu system, so actually one of the things that we decided to do is also remove some, uh, uh, some options uh, in this layout to avoid having to wrap and, and have to change the layout dramatically. So I take a look at, you know, business-wise, what makes sense to maybe not push uh, forward as much as, uh, as other things, and so we kind of remove that. But pretty much it's the same layout. Now, you turn it uh, in portrait mode, and again, the, the, the main content area, actually, the layout holds up pretty well, uh, you know, using the standard grids. The only thing that I do, actually, is kind of reduce a little bit the font size of that top menu, because I really want to keep that sub-navigation sub, that, uh, sub -navigation with also the context in there. So, not that many changes. It's pretty much the same experience. Now, of course, you know, the biggest changes you would expect would be kind of in a much smaller format, you know, like a smartphone. So let's look at how that, what happens there. So now you'll see that there are quite a lot of changes. So what happens there? Uh, the logo is smaller. So the logo, you know, the brand is important for my business. And the business, you know, the, the, the brand was and the logo was kind of in a large size in the previous site, had the space to have a nice logo. But on a mobile, you know, we want to reduce the size because I don't want to feel it cramped and don't want to uh, to take too much space, because again, the ab above, you know, we're all familiar with above the fold concept, where you know, if if everything is below the screen, then it's not a good experience for users. Uh, the search, which was in the top right, moves underneath the logo, 
uh, I don't have exact numbers, so, uh, but, but there is quite a lot of people on the mobile browsers that, actually, that, that prefer to just search on something because, again, the navigation can be, the number of page refresh and all this can be slow, so they'd rather just go directly to the page using search versus actually going through a navigation system. So make your search permanent. And if you don't have a search on your site today, get a search. Uh, it, you have to have a search. Uh, one thing you notice also that we had some social icons on the uh, top right. Now those disappear completely. Uh, because one, because of space, and also just uh, uh, because you have to pick, you know, you can't cram everything that you, that you want into this, uh, this mobile experience, so you gotta pick and choose what is the most important. Now, the main difference also is that the navigation, so the whole menu system that you had on top, uh, that was a column system, you know, with nice, now, you know, you, that doesn't work on a mobile. Uh, uh, one, because you, there's no hover state, and also because it would take too much space. So, there are a lot of different philosophies on what to do with menus in a responsive uh, environment. Uh, there's a, a school of thought that, you know, has a button where you click and then there's a, something expands or opens up, and then you choose, closes it, you know. For this particular case, we have quite a lot of menus, and uh, so I, I chose for this particular iteration of the site to use a, a select, uh, basically a drop down, And um, it worked pretty well. I, I, I thought that for my, for my non-technical users, it would be a bit more intuitive than having, let's say, a little square menu with three lines that no one really knows what it means. Uh, or even the menu, right? So if you think of it, you know, we think we know what a menu is. It's pretty logical. Uh, 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 somebody, you know, a 50-year-old grandmother who's you know, used a computer for only, you know, five years might not know that this thing that she clicks on is actually called a menu. So, you know, this allows me to say, please select to navigate. It's not perfect, but at least it works, and it's, you know, I've not had too many problems. And also, one of the key things is that the left sidebar, so all these options that were on your, the sidebar, actually have disappeared and have dropped down. They don't, have not disappeared, but they've dropped down below the content, because the content is what I want people to focus on. And in this case, the product. So if we look, you know, keep scrolling down, you'll see that the tabs, they actually work pretty well, uh, because I only have two tabs. Uh, if I had three, four tabs, then I would need to look at doing something, maybe switching over to a vertical tab concept. Uh, versus a, a horizontal one. In this case, it actually worked pretty well, so that was okay. My uh, media players resized. I, since we sell audio audiobooks and audio content, all our, uh, a lot of our pages have audio players on them. And you'll notice, again, as you scroll down again, these uh, uh, options that were in the sidebar now are below the content. So they have not disappeared. Uh, uh, if your uh, customer is very engaged, they can still scroll down and see those options. So let's look at some of the uh, considerations when you're doing responsive design. Like I said, it's not about layout. It's not just about layout. Layout is a key part of going responsive, but there's also a, a train of thought that uh, it, it, makes you, it forces you to think about things. And I, one thing with responsive is that, you know, we say responsive as one word, but it goes from a really purely hardcore, you know, uh, very streamlined uh, concept and it's very, you know, there's a wide range of responsive, how much of it is responsive and how hardcore. So yeah, we really have to put that in perspective. But some of the things you have to think about are definitely the images. Uh, one for uh, uh, speed reasons, right? You don't want to uh, uh, have a lot of images uh, uh, take up a lot of bandwidth. Uh, but also because, you know, above the fold, when you have, you know, this much space to work with, you don't want, you know, an image to be the, the, only, the first thing they see and the only thing they see and actually have to scroll to even see the page title or content. So you have to think about this. Like, okay, well, then do, what do I do? Is an image really necessary? Uh, or can I move it, you know, if it is, can I move it down lower in the content instead of having it first? And also, this is also where the uh, source ordering helps. You can actually change some things here. Uh, another thing that you have to think about is, you know, your submenus. You know, we're used to having this nice space with this little, really nice uh, hover effects and multi-column layouts and all these things. We cram a lot of things in our menu. Um, that, way, that would take way too much space on a smaller format screen. So now you need to think about, okay, do I need, do I change my navigation? Do I reduce it? 
or do I present it in another manner? So that's another thing that you have to keep in mind. Another one is to highlight the search. Uh, you'll notice most responsive sites actually have search be very prominent because that's something that, again, you want to go from point A to point B in maybe in a faster and more direct way than when you're uh, uh, in a desktop experience and you just kind of click around and, and, and you can kind of discovery. Uh, especially if you have a site that has a lot of content, people will actually search on the content. Uh, um. Then you also, sometimes, uh, you have to focus on key navigation or pages or workflows that, you, that are the core of your business or of the website experience that you're trying to convey. Uh, there are a lot of fluff that we tend to add uh, uh, to, uh, to a website because we have the space, because we have, you know, but then you have to kind of think, okay, well, when I have this limited view, is what I'm showing on a desktop really kind of the thought that someone is, is, is that really what I want someone to focus on? So that might change also. It might not, but it might. In our case, for example, we drop some of these uh, submenus that are not that important to kind of make the navigation still a great experience, but reduce the amount of uh, data. Another one also that we don't think about is social icons, right? Sharing, you know, share, like, uh, pin, and, and whatever, you know, one comes out every day. Uh, there's two reasons. One, because the, the, the JavaScript that gets loaded is actually huge. Uh, the other one also that we tend not to think about, but if you have a mobile device and you've hit you know, share on Twitter or, or, or like, where does it go to? It goes to the web version of Facebook or of Twitter. It doesn't launch your Twitter client. And most people in a mobile environment have apps. So you have your Twitter app. And so most people are not logged in to the website. So now you're like, oh, you're so excited, you want to share uh, an article, you hit, you know, like, or you hit Twitter. And now you're asked to log on onto the web page of Twitter. So I would, you know, it'd be great to see a study. I haven't, I haven't seen anything, but it'd be great to see the, the drop off and the difference between liking on a mobile device versus liking on, the, on the, you know, on a desktop. I, I think the numbers are quite dramatic. I know as a user, I never do it. So these, and there are a lot more, but these are kind of some of the considerations that you think about when you build your site. Sorry, so how is it built? So because this is a use case, let's talk quickly uh, about how the, the site is built. So leading cast. So uh, I mentioned Red Shop. Why Red Shop? Uh, one, because it's supported, right? You have a shopping cart, means that you make money. You make money, it needs to be something that you can rely on, right? It's a tool. Uh, 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 and so it has to be supported. And Red Shop is pretty well supported. It's actively developed also. Right? So I don't want to base my business, or at least you know, one or two years of my business, onto something that might not get updated or has slow development uh, cycle. Right? It is a tool. It drives my business. If that tool fails, I don't make any money. So it's, it's something that you have to think about. Uh, it's got a good override system. So there are things. You know, and I know they're in the room, so I apologize, but uh, you know, it's not perfect. No, no, no piece of software is perfect, and based on your workflows, might not fit. But overall, the override uh, template system is actually relatively easy, uh, especially to move into a, a, a kind of a, of a medium responsive, you know, not a hardcore responsive uh, uh, way, but you know, to be able to be 80% of the way there, it's actually pretty good. And also, they're, you know, they've, they've claimed that they're moving towards bootstrap. So we know that it's a shopping cart that uh, a developer that knows that mobile is important, that responsive is important. So that's actually, that's, that gives me faith. And it's also relatively cheap for the support that they give you. Uh, the other one is K2. Uh, you know, it's great for image handling, uh, resizing. You know, that's really one of the key things, especially since 2.5 added a lot more features on the content side. But uh, I still, you know, I have non-technical non bloggers and, 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 and users that actually upload images and all this. I want my images to look the same. I want them to be resized. I don't want them to use the software to do that. So K2 is great for that. I also, like I mentioned, again, I have uh, extensive blog. And so, you know, with blog, you need tags. And so uh, there's still, to me, that's still the, the best solution for tags. And also, the, the over overrides uh, on the uh, templates and the modules is also extremely simple, uh, which I like. And, but uh, honestly, it's because all my content was in K2 already before, so the migration was, is, is actually was easier. The other leading cast is uh, SH44 Ceph. 
you know, there's always a love and hate relationship with, with Ceph components, um, but uh, to, to get a fine URL control, especially when you have a large site, you know, if you have a smaller site with maybe 20, 30 pages, you can do more, you know, more handcrafting of your URLs and metadata and all this, but if you have a large site with, you know, 600 different views, pages, then you need something that gives you kind of a finer URL control, uh, both from a usability point of view for your users, but also from an SEO point of view. Uh, it's very good also with a centralized metadata management, so to be able to add metadata onto your pages without, in one area instead of actually having to jump everywhere. Uh, it does some nice things with duplicate issues when you have, uh, if you run into these where uh, your modules suddenly don't show, don't show up when they should. And also the good thing is that uh, it's the official uh, choice of Red Shop. They, they do, you know, they use a lot uh, the SH44 for their, uh, for their stuff and also of K2. So you might as well stay with people that kind of have the same, uh, you know, that, that, you know, run in the same circles. Like any movie, uh, uh, you know, the, the supporting cast is as, impo is as important as the, uh, as the leading uh, actors. In this case, it's uh, uh, the no number extensions, which if you have not used no number extensions, run out and get them. It's, uh, they're, I mean, I don't build any uh, Joomla site without them, uh, especially Advanced Module Manager. Uh, the forms uh, done using uh, RS, forms, RS Forms Pro, which also is very good, and I'll show you some of the integration things that I've done with it uh, to give you some pretty complex kind of uh, integrations. Uh, JC, and of course, last but not least, uh, uh, it's your business. If your site is not up, you're not making money. So if your site is not getting backed up, it's pretty much, you know, you're driving on a highway, you know, on the Autobahn with, with your eyes closed. Uh, and, you, you know, you should have a great backup strategy in place uh, uh, because it is your livelihood. So let's move a bit more into the use case and look at some workflow and integration examples. I'm going to go a little bit quickly through them because I am a little bit uh, uh, late. I spent, I didn't realize that few people had gone to all the responsive sessions, so I spent a bit more time on the responsive side. So, as a business user, uh, you want to be able to capture leads. You know, the sales is a great thing. When, you know, once you convert someone to a sale, but you know, you also want to have a way to capture uh, your users, capture emails, so you can t stay in touch with them, in contact. And one of the things that I was looking at is uh, looking at a, a way to be able to have at the same time uh, a way to collect some information from my users, so, uh, so I could give them access to a free section of the site, so a, a registered only section of the site, but in the least amount of fields, and also be able to but capture some data. Uh, one of the things that I don't like in Joomla is by default to register in Joomla, you need a username. And, you know, we might have our favorite usernames, but a non-technical user, you ask them to remember their email, a password, and a username, and it's not, it's not a good user experience. Everyone remembers, knows their, their, their email address. No one, there's no conflict between two people having the same email address. So uh, let's use that as the uh, unique ident identifier. And also, uh, running user usability tests, uh, uh, I ran this test uh, on 10, 10 users uh, uh, from different backgrounds uh, recently, and I was shocked that out of those 10, Eight users actually mentioned how they appreciated the fact that to register onto the site, they didn't have to then validate through an email. Uh, 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 an email. I chose to basically, you know, allow them to create an account without a verification. With the username, it's dangerous to do that because then someone will just, you know, write a bogus email. But when you ask them for the email as the key identifier they will actually put in their real email address and assume that they're maybe going to get sent something, but then you say, hey, no, you're ready. Your content is there. So it's very useful for that. So what did I pick to, to do this? So uh, uh, there's this email as username uh, plugin that actually over, you know, installs and overrides a lot of your different registration systems so that it actually removes the username requirement from it. So now you can log into your site with either your, use, your you know, with your email address, but it also, if you remember your username and then use your username, it will actually do that too. And then I use you know, RS Forms Pro with uh, it has a plugin to create accounts automatically from you know from filling in a form and it creates an account. And also I use Mailchimp for a, a newsletter uh, uh, you know uh, component. And I'm actually going to skip this slide over, but. 
I, I expect MailChimp because it's got some nice, uh, uh, some really nice kind of uh, uh, things that for my business are key. That's why I'm, I'm not using a built-in component. So I needed something to interface with it. So I was able to get the form down to three fields. And there's been a lot of usability uh, uh, studies showing that uh, uh, the more uh, information you ask from your users, the less conversion you get. Uh, in this case, I chose to use first name, but I'm actually running some uh, A-B tests to see uh, even removing the first name. I'm just asking them for email and password. I have to ask them for password because I'm creating an account at the same time. But you know, compared to the regular Joomla registration, that's, you know, I don't ask them to verify password, which, okay, I'm, 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 I lose maybe 5% you know, of, uh, of the people who maybe mistype their, type or their password and they have to create another account, but it doesn't matter. I mean, for 95% of the users, the experience is, much, is a lot seamless. So you set up your form in, uh, in uh, RS4, you know, like you do, like most uh, form components, create a lot of hidden fields, and through JavaScript, I can actually pick, <laughs> thank you. Uh, that's great, it's like the, the Oscars. <laughs> Wrap it up, stretch. Um, so you can actually create you know, all your fields, and with JavaScript, you can pick up, you know, uh, uh, for example, the geolocation. Right? Uh, my, my users are worldwide. Uh, I have you know, people from everywhere in the world buying my products, and it's interesting to see kind of the, the geographic. Uh, and so I'm able to actually pick from their IP number, pick a geolocation, you know, find out where they are, and actually send that over to MailChimp. So you do these, create your Joomla account plugin, where you can actually map uh, your, um, uh, your form fields to specific registration uh, aspects of, uh, of your account. And here you'll see that both username, email, and verify emails come from the same field. So then I completely take out the, uh, the email as uh, uh, requirements. Uh, and then basically there's a MailChimp plugin that actually you give it the API key from MailChimp, and it will actually go and fetch all the fields that you have in your newsletter uh, uh, system, and you can actually sync sing them back and forth, which is very useful. You can also uh, put your users in different segments. You can maybe register them for your regular newsletter and then send them an autoresponder, which every day or every week kind of sends them new email. Uh, uh, so that's uh, uh, really powerful. And then basically once, uh, I don't know, anybody use MailChimp here? Okay, all right, so uh, it's, it's, it's one of the most popular uh, newsletter systems. And you'll see that, you know, I've cropped the emails, uh, so you don't see them, but you know, I have country information. I have the date at which they're registered, because I can actually create autoresponders that are based on that date. Uh, I know which form they filled, right? So, so if you're doing A-B comparisons, or if you have multiple areas in your site when someone can actually register, you can actually give it the referral so you actually know and can see which of your forms are more, uh, get more conversion this way. And also maybe based on the area that they fill the form in, you can actually also segment them into different groups. Uh, and you, know, you get the IP, you, you get all kinds of information, and that's very extensible. So it's, it's something that I would uh, uh, very much uh, encourage uh, you, you guys to look into it. It's, it's some really nice thing because your business uh, is only as good as your leads and how to convert them. So keeping in touch with them is, is, is a key thing. Another thing that I wanted to do is, uh, uh, by default, you know, most of those cards, when you add something, so unless you use Ajax, where, which pip, pop, pops up a modal window uh, that says, oh, you've just added a product. And, uh, you know, I don't like that experience personally. I like it when it's more in context, especially on different devices. That modal uh, experience uh, can be very sketchy. So I like to just put, you know, where, where the system message goes, say, oh, you know, your product was added. Unfortunately, by default, that's kind of how it looks, right? On top of your content, you get this little box that says, you know, product added to your cart. Uh, based on the usability test, my users were very confused. I was confused most of the time. So what I wanted to do is I, the first thing I do when I have a question on how to handle uh, a workflow in a store is that I go to Amazon, right? Because we know that Amazon does not lift a single figure, does not push a single pixel to the left without doing massive uh, testing. And so usually what, uh, what Amazon does is usually a good example. I go to Apple, I go to Target, I go all to all these different sites. And you know, one of the things that I liked on the Amazon site is when you add a product, it doesn't pop up a modal window. It actually, atop, on top of the, you know, your content, it actually says, you know, item added, added to your car, and it actually right there gives you two buttons. Now, I have not found a way to override, uh, without doing a core hack, to override these messages to be able to insert uh, buttons and things like that. So, 
In 10 minutes, I was able to do this using no number re-replacer. Basically, it, it, what it does is that it replaces, you know, it looks for a, a string uh, that appears on your website, and when it finds that string, it'll basically replace it with whatever you, 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 you want. So another string, or in this case, with a piece of code. And so I was able to add the buttons, add the link, and all this in this code. So in 10 minutes, you can actually create and enhance your experience, experiences. And not only that, but this is also uh, responsive, too, because I'm using uh, the grid system to do this. So time-wise, uh, yes, OK. I'll quickly also go through um, uh, the media player. Uh, I'm using a, a lot of audio on the site. A lot of you use audio, video, and things like that. Uh, and you know, one of the first reflex you have is to there's a lot of extensions that use uh, that allow you to you know put YouTube links and all these kind of things. Um, I didn't decided not to use one of those uh, for multiple reasons. Why? Because I wanted to be light. Again, you know, responsive. You have to really think about uh, size of uh, of your downloads. Uh, I noticed that even the leading uh, uh, media player uh, extensions would load up you know, four or five JavaScript files to handle QuickTime, even though I never use any QuickTime, or you know, different CSS to styles. I wanted something that was light, uh, that had a nice HTML5. Again, responsive is not just about the layout, right? When you display media, you have to think about uh, uh, what, you know, of course, you know, most iOS devices don't support Flash, but they're also, the experiences are very different even on other uh, devices. So you have to think about using players and, and, and video players, media players that are appropriate for those ex ex um, experiences. It's got very active development. So uh, I'm using JW Player, which is one, probably the standard uh, uh, audio player out there. I also wanted to customize it. I'm using Amazon S3. Again, deliverability. Uh, uh, my customers are worldwide, so I don't want to always have them link to files that are maybe in the US if they're in South Africa. Uh, so I use a content delivery network, and, uh, or, and I use Amazon S3 to push out uh, uh, content as close as possible to my users. That's another aspect of, of, of doing responsive. It's not responsive in the common, you know, uh, 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 thinking of you know what we're talking about the frameworks that resize and all this, but it's, you also it makes you think. Okay, how can I reach my customer as quickly as possible? And if they're in South Africa, you know, going through a U.S. server to deliver them anything is not the fastest route. And also, it hooks up to analytics. As a business user, everything in your site should be hooked up to analytics uh, uh, so that you can actually make decisions on real numbers. And so uh, to do this, I'm using uh, no number. Uh, sorcerer, uh, basically be able to include some, uh, some codes, include a ver uh, fluid grid, include the JavaScript from, a, uh, from the player that I've, uh, that I've customized, and now my content editor can just, in the content, write snip audio slash and then the file name, and there's some very, I'm not a hardcore coder, so I've done this very easily, but in the back end, I actually, based on uh, if they're using a, a Firefox HTML5 that does not support MP3, I deliver them automatically an, uh, an AUG file, or I de deliver an MP3 file, uh, uh, and they all reference uh, something that is outside my roots, which also is kind of hard to do on, on, um, on, existing, uh, uh, on, on existing extensions out there. One thing I want to convey also is that we tend to be very Joomla-focused. Uh, to solve your issues, look at other places also. Don't just focus on, on what's available. You know, if your first thing is to go to look for an extension, well, there may be a way to do it which is not Joomla-related, which actually is very efficient for your site. And one of the things I wanted to, uh, one of the things I, I strongly believe in is, is uh, Cloudflare. So anybody familiar with Cloudflare here? Oh, that is shocking, just one person. I, it's, it's, it's scary. So, Everyone thinks that a CDN is super expensive, that I have to invest all this money and all this. Cloudflare is an incredible CDN, and it's free. You can go today, sign up for Cloudflare, and by the end of tomorrow, your site will be replicated in 14 different places, and all your static content, images, CSS, JavaScript, will be delivered from, you know, closer to your user uh, uh, instead of, uh, instead of from, from a server. And so, the Cloudflare, it, it, and it's free. You know, I, I'm, I'm shocked that I've been, I, I don't work for them, I don't get a cut, but it's something that I'm very passionate about is, is that everyone can run a CDN. So, you know, we all think about caching, we all think about reducing the size of JavaScript, of CSS, and all this, but then we all deliver everything from one place. So, again, think outside of Joomla 
for your customers to have better experiences, and especially, again, on those mobile devices. So what does Cloudflare do? Uh, quickly, it basically caches all your, uh, all your ref uh, resources. Static, it won't cache your dynamic content, so your site will still be updated to the minute based on your changes, but it'll cache you know, your images, your CSS, your JavaScript, all this kind of stuff. It will uh, auto-minify your CSS and JavaScript, so probably some of you use either the template, uh, template built, built you know, kind of minimizer that takes all your CSS files and crunches them together, or, or you use another third-party extension. While this does it, you don't actually, your site never changes. It's when they push out the CSS to, to different users that they minify it on the fly. So it's also very super useful. Uh, it works offline. If suddenly your server goes down, it will actually render content from all the cached information. We'll, we'll deliver uh, cached content. So if you have a downtime of about five minutes, sometimes your users don't even notice them. And again, that's all free. Uh, so it does security blocking, with, you know, hot linking, all kinds of different things. Uh, it does give you uh, geolocation, which usually is uh, relatively expensive to get a good, accurate geolocation. It's actually pretty expensive. Uh, uh, here it's for free. And they have a pro uh, version, which costs uh, just $20 a month, which is pretty reasonable. And they are doing really exciting things on that end, especially concerning uh, 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 responsive. So they're doing things like uh, when you go to a particular page, they look at all the stats of, of who's visited that particular page, and they'll actually th say, ooh, you know, 90% of users that went to this page actually went to this page afterwards. And so they'll start preloading uh, images and CSS and all that from the other page so that when you decide to move, it will load almost instantly. Again, it's not responsive in terms of this little tiny responsiveness of, you know, uh, kind of you know, view that we, we talk about in, 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 you know, at, the, at Jab, but it's also, it delivers a faster experience to user and that's part of being responsive. It also does something that they introduced in beta, which is they're actually now resizing images on the server to deliver, you know, instead of having a large image that gets delivered on your desktop that's maybe 800 pixel wide, they'll actually look at the devices that access, access it and in real time in the servers, resize the image and actually deliver a separate image size to your users without you having to do anything in your code. It's just it's when they, uh, they cache the images, they cache, you know, uh, different sizes. And also, uh, I look at your ISP that you're using today. They have partnerships with most ISPs, even the smaller ones, so they probably already installed on your, on your things. One of the things also they do is they give you all these dashboards with security. And you can see this is just 30 days uh, of last month. And you'll see that I saved 30 gigabyte of bandwidth by using through, uh, you're going through them. Because all my GIFs, all my PNGs, all my CSS, they were all delivered not by my server and the hosting that I'm using, but by Cloudflare. It actually, uh, out of uh, 1.5 million requests, total requests, uh, uh, Cloudflare actually uh, uh, took care of more than a million requests. That means that you can maybe you know, uh, uh, save a bit more or buy a, a better quality uh, hosting and invest a bit more money in there with, with limited resources because with Cloudflare you can actually you know, save a lot of those resources. So in conclusion, uh, quickly, again, these are more like philosophical things. It's, it's definitely for responsive, you know, and, and for any business, pretty much. I mean, that, can, that doesn't really apply to, business, to, to responsive only, but always consider your target audience, right? We talk a lot in theories about, oh, we need to do this, responsive needs to do that. Just look at your customer base. Maybe your customers are never coming in through a mobile. You don't care about that. But maybe, you know, you'd be surprised. By looking at your stats, you can be very, uh, uh, very surprised, like I was when I found out that, even the, you know, I would expect the, the number of page views, the, the duration of site to dramatically reduce uh, on mobile, and it did not. So that's something that's, you know, it's your revenue, right? Please invest money in your tools. You know, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm so scared when I go to the forums, I go to help out, and I see people that, that you know, oh, I, my business is built onto this, and, you know, and, but I don't want, you know, oh, they're asking me $10 for that. It's like, Wait a second, if you're making money out of this, it's your tool, invest in your tool, don't be cheap. Uh, always be testing. You can launch your site with, all, you know, with everything works, you tested your workflow and all this, and something happens. And you know, the, your, your ISP change a little configuration, which suddenly turns and breaks, uh, you know, the uh, returning from PayPal and getting a validation. And, and you don't realize it, and suddenly, you know, your sales start dropping or your customer calls goes up, and you're like, what, what happened? So keep testing. 
you know, every month, every week, run transactions yourselves. You know, use a fake PayPal account, you know, a, a credit card where you get, re, you know, you, you basically do a, tr um, a reimbursement afterwards. But do, you know, use your site as your users would. Make a transaction from a mobile, you know, on your iPhone. Have you ever tried, if you're running a store, have you ever tried to buy something from your iPhone? It's an interesting experience. Um, so always, you know, always be testing. And always be learning. Don't, don't, don't just you know, look at the new technologies, right? Responsive is a good thing. You know, if you're in the, in the room, it means that you're kind of forward thinking about you know, responsiveness. But not just about Joomla. Look at what's happening in the industry. Look at what other uh, 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 you know, uh, communities or even uh, how, what other sites are using and how are they improving their customer experience either by using different technology, by using things like you know, Cloudflare and CDNs, all these kind of things. So always, you know, it's part of your, as a business owner, uh, it's part of, 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 of your DNA to have to look forward, not just for you know, your future projections and revenue, but also where the industry is going. And don't be afraid to, don't be afraid to adjust and change. Uh, this design has been up for about, uh, since February, I think. And actually, I'm, I've been waiting for Jab to be over to switch my design. Because I've, after some usability testing, we realized it's, you know, it's a bit too much information, it's not modern enough. I don't care. I'm, if, if, if I know that something is not working well on my site, change it. Don't wait until, oh, well, you know, I, I've just changed this, so I don't want to confuse my users. Uh, I, you know, if your users, if you know that your users are already confused by this experience and you know a way to improve it, do it. Don't wait. So, sorry, I don't want to be preaching, but it's, it's, it's kind of common things that, that I see. So anyway, thank you very much for attending the session and uh, thanks for Jab for inviting me. It was pretty exciting to, especially in the, in the big room. I'm gonna take a picture. And if you have any questions, you can actually uh, um, you know, follow me on Twitter. Uh, I'll, I'll warn you, I, I make some really stupid jokes on Twitter also, so not everyone understands my uh, French humor. Uh, but uh, so, oh, cool, thank you. Uh, send me that, <laughs> send me a picture. Uh, and uh, you know, feel free if you have any questions on uh, either responsive or shopping carts or anything, uh, uh, or even you know, business management, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to talk to you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>